So I think we need to reimagine publishing, right? Um, Elsevier, biggest publication company out there, uh, but it's not alone. So let's just begin, shall we? And let's just, let's just take it easy and just go through the kind of basics of what it means to be a researcher. So before this talk and before I've written papers on open science and stuff, I go around and dutifully read papers. And this is a good one, um, growing in accessibility of science, but there's a snag. Uh, when I go to look at it, it's beyond a paywall, uh, which is kind of ironic. Um, but that's okay because I am part of a university that has a subscription to the journal. So that means I can, I can access the papers for free. Um, uh, so I do the reading, I write my paper, and then I want to get it sort of published. And before it gets published, I have to go through a round of peer review. And um, this is any reputable journal will have a good peer review process. And this is just a quality control check to make sure that there's good scientific merit. Um, as I go along that journey, um, I pass through peer review eventually, and I'm asked to make changes to the paper. Um, and once those corrections are done, I submit it back and I have to pay a article processing charge, which seems reasonable. Uh, company has to pay staff to do all the pretty typefacing and beautify it and put their little Elsevier logo at the top, which costs um, money, I guess. But you know, it's it's quite a it's quite a ball ache, I have to say, to constantly have to publish. Do I have to publish? You know, is there an option not to publish? Can I just not just do the research and read when I want to and you know just teach and, and not need to worry about that? Well, the fact is, uh, no, you you do have to publish. You have to publish if you want to get a permanent post. Uh, and the reason why is because. At one time, the number of papers you get published or the amount of citations you have is a sort of a performance indicator, really, and a, and a decent one at that. It does show how prolific you are and, and how uh, impactful your work is. Unfortunately, though, these measures have become metrics or benchmarks, which you are evaluated against in, the, in your job evaluation criteria. And publications are really the currency uh, with which you 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 base your career progression on. You need to have a good publication track record. And the sort of villain in this piece is this thing called a journal impact factor, which you should know is uh, for a given journal, it's the, the number of citations on average each paper gets. And obviously the higher the impact factor, the, the more citations uh, papers published in that journal gets, and therefore the more impactful the journal is, more prestigious. Of course, we all know that journal impact factors are as useful as a chocolate kettle, but they are used nonetheless. And they have created, uh, helped create this situation where the measures of performance have now become targets. So that was a quick and dirty summary of what it's like in the day in the life of a researcher. So what have we learned from this process? Well, we've learned that our career progression rests in large part on, on an individual's publication track record. Of course, grant, grant funding is important, but so too is publications. And because journal impact factors is a signifier of impact supposedly on a field, the tension is more on where you publish rather than what you publish. Uh, journals with high impact factors, if you can put those under your belt, you'll be really well on your way. And many people have got careers, and they've said this to me openly, because they published in science or cell or, or nature. Journals then are in a really strong position. They, they have a captive audience. Uh, we rely on them to complete, have a complete record of, of scientific research. We also rely on them to do a quality control check through peer review and to also report the science in a standard way that is comprehensible to, to people in the field. So making sure the intro method and results are all tip top. And we need to publish, otherwise we'll perish. Now, I wonder if the journals need to do all of this stuff 
And I wonder in particular if they need to do this quality control bit. And I'll return to this later on in the, in the slides. So let's give the journals the benefit of the doubt. You know, it, absolute power might not always corrupt absolutely. Um, so let's have a look at how they do in first, how they re keep a record of science and also how they do the peer review. Well, if you remember back to the Mentimeter, Elsevier have a pretty decent profit margin of around 36 to 40%. And where do they get this money from? Uh, well, they get it from subscription fees, which could be anywhere up to 10 to 15 million pound per university, which is a lot of money down the back of the sofa. And they also have the APCs as well, which could range from anywhere between 10 pounds to 10,000 pounds. And what's really good about this model actually is that all of the content that they publish is given to them for free. We submit our work to them. And the quality control is done by us as well for free. So if this is quite a tricky thing to get your head around, um, I did ask Twitter, which is a fund of all knowledge, as we know, and uh, they came up with this really nice analogy. So cows make milk, they milk themselves. Other cows check the milk for free. Cows get this, pay the farmer to take the milk away. Then the farmer, and you won't believe this, honestly, sells the milk back to the cows. That is, in a nutshell, what academic publishing is. The one thing that's missing, though, from this, which makes it not totally great, is where the money comes from. Who is actually paying for this? And it's the public purse. It's the taxpayer. They fund universities in large part, generally speaking, across the world, and they pay for the, the subscription fees, but also they fund the funding councils that fund our research that will then go on to fund the APCs as well. So they have two sources of revenue coming to them from the same um, pot, which is quite remarkable. Now, um, this whole story can be traced back to a particular zero patient. Um, and for those who don't know, a zombie, zombie analogy is the zero patient, which is where the virus began. And this guy here is um, Robert Maxwell. And you probably don't know him because he's, he's mostly known in Britain, but you will know her. This is actually Jeffrey Epstein's former partner, and I cannot for the life of me remember her first name. It's Gillet or Giselle, I, I can never pronounce it. Uh, and we all know about Jeffrey Epstein, that's his daughter. Now, going back to Robert, he kind of came up with this idea of creating a money-making system, and he did it through his business, Perg Pergamon Papers, I think it was called, uh, via Springer. And effectively, what he did was that he created this sort of mythology around papers, uh, journals, he would create ever more journals in ever more specific areas, because what that meant was that would inflate the portfolio of their of Pergamon, I think it's Pergamon or Pergamon, I can never remember, it would inflate the portfolio, and that would make a better business case to ask for universities to pay subscriptions to the publication house. So you have a lot of papers that you could have access to, even though they're just very, very narrowly different. And of course, he really liked this idea of sexing up journals as well as these sort of rock star papers for you to, uh, to publish in. And all of this is, is detailed in this really nice article here. Of course, he disappeared off a boat somewhere, um, but before he did this, he did sell off his company to uh, the little known Elsevier at the time, and that became what it is today. So the driver of the revenue of journals is through APCs and subscriptions and free labor. And in order to keep the money coming in, they need to sort of inflate the importance of journals. And they can do this through a variety of ways, but 
principally through the journal impact factor that's a huge selling point of why people want to read papers from them but also why they want to publish there as well now we know what makes up a journal impact factor it's the number of citations and so what gets cited well interesting stuff gets cited significant results get cited groundbreaking novel innovative stuff gets cited so there is a vested interest a conflict of interest actually in in public pub, publishers and journals to to pad their portfolio with these types of studies so no wonder there is a publication bias now of course, it's not just all journals, and I'm not being so silly as to say that the, the reason why we're in this mess with publication bias is just for the bottom line of journals. That would be silly and reductionist, but it is a contributing factor. And if you don't, if you doubt the existence of publication bias, there's lots of research out there. And and for those who who want a working definition, it's basically that when you read papers, you're reading a biased selection of, of the available literature, the available number of studies that have been reported. Um, and why you have that is not just because the journals, as I say, are biased in, in what they desk reject, I guess you would say, um, but also because certain types of studies get published, we as researchers tend to prioritize publishing the sexier results, the flashier results over the null results. Of course, it's changing in some aspects. And this is sort of demonstrated in Daniel Fanelli's work uh, ad nauseum, really. In this study here, he, um, he examined abstracts where he looked for the phrase test a hypothesis or supported the hypothesis. And he found that over time, the number of studies found support for their hypothesis sort of went up almost exponentially. This is from neuroscience of behavior research, this is psychology and psychiatry. So basically here, nearly 100% of papers were reporting positive results. Now this either means that we're publishing very mundane tests of hypotheses that we kind of know what the answer to, or there is a sort of publication bias going on. Now, there is a limitation to this work um, and I'm sorry if I'm laboring this point, but there is a limitation in that, of course, if you test your hypothesis and find a significant result, you are more likely to put that in your abstract. So it is a biased way of looking at things, but it's a, a crude yet not unrealistic uh, estimate. Now let's go on to the quality control check. Um, pretty good on the whole, um, or is it? Um, now, the brilliant Stuart Ritchie published this book, which I urge you all to read, a very clear, crystal clear um, a book that talks all about the issues with, with uh, reproducibility in, in research. Now you could say, well, you know, there's the odd bad entity. We've got Ben, we've got Starp or Wanzink and, and Wakefield. These could be outliers. Uh, they could just be bad apples that just slip through. Well, you could say that, I mean, but Wakefield did get published in Lancet and Ben, I forget where, but I think it was the Journal of Psychology ecological science. It was a high impact journal nonetheless. Staple, Sarpa was um, uh, science, I believe. Um, but we, we kind of know, um, we kind of know that it's not just outliers or bad apples. It's, there's a pervasive and widespread issue with questionable research practices. And I think the speaker immediately before this talk, um, uh, last week or the week before, talked about the flexibility in, in p-values and just how easy it is to cut corners. Dorothy Bishop did a great uh, paper here where it sort of outlined four issues, p-hacking, uh, reporting bias or selective reporting, um, harking and low power. But you can see here, there's a litany of this sort of issues with replication. So clearly there are, there are it, this is, this is I, I would say more than you would expect if if peer review was uh, working optimally. Um, but so there's things missed in the peer review, uh, questionable research practices. And the reason why is because they they leave no trace. You don't know whether somebody is retrofitting a hypothesis. Uh, there's no transparency there in the sort of the cultivation of the research idea and transparency th throughout the workflow of a uh, of a research project. But there's also an asymmetry in how null and positive results are, are handled. Um, you, 
there is an issue that we are in the business of falsifying stuff and it's very difficult to to demonstrate evidence of absence um um or sorry I, I, um yes evidence of absence rather than absence of evidence um so there's all sorts of reasons why you would find a null result poor power poor design of the study um that are more readily available than when we've got positive results that seem to fit our, our expectations a paper that's aged particularly well is this one by Mahoney, where he just submitted the same paper, roughly the same paper to different reviewers. And he showed the intro method and results. And in one version, the there were positive results. And in the second version, there were negative results. And this is some of the comments, bearing in mind that these could be cherry picked, but nonetheless. Um, one of the referees said, this is a very fine study. Uh, I'm not seeing the discussion section, but uh, I don't see how it could be far off the mark. Excellent paper, definitely merits publishing, right? So that's the positive result version. Negative results, there are so many problems with this paper, it's difficult to decide where to begin. Well, I have not seen the discussion that I can't think of what would be able to save this paper. This paper is perpetrating a serious mistake and conclusion by unwary readers. Um, now, this is probably maybe you know extreme example but it's not that extreme i don't think so how can we reimagine scientific publishing hopefully i've convinced you that we're in a bad way but i am preaching to the converted so how can we sink our teeth in and try and find a way to reimagine scientific publishing well in the uk at least the gisc which which negotiates on behalf of um i the uh, higher education sector universities in the UK is, tr is is bartering a new deal with Elsevier and we have promising green shoots of uh, a spine in in universities with MIT um, ends negotiations with Elsevier and I think there's been a few universities in Europe but I could be mistaken on that I haven't been keeping track um, unfortunately uh, but I know that there's something going on <laughs> um, but generally, you just need to be prepared to walk away. And it really does uh, um, arguably have a minimal impact. So there will be at least effort from Elsevier to try and make a more workable solution to their extortionate uh, subscription costs. But I don't want to get in the weeds with this because I don't find it particularly interesting um, what universities do. Um, what I want to know is, is what we can do. Uh, in our own research practice, because I think that's that's really quite important and what is most beneficial to you because that has the direct impact. Well, let's just start with the registered reports. I think we all know what a registered report is by now. For those who don't, you effectively um, submit to a participating journal your, your protocol before you've accessed the data or collected it. And through several rounds of, of review, you refine that protocol and then you get an IPA, an in-principle acceptance, which means that if you, providing you go out, collect the data and um, follow the protocol and report it in the way that you said you would, uh, you will get published regardless of the results. So you can go away and collect the data in safe knowledge that you will get published. So this means that you no longer have to file draw things. It means that there's a good quality check that's free of having seen the results to see whether they are sexy and innovative to, to fluff up the journal impact factor and all the rest of it. So it's a really elegant solution. It's the closest thing we have in my view to a silver bullet to deal with a lot of the issues with reproducibility. Now these slides are adapted from Chris Chambers so I do recommend that you go to see the, the source but um, this figure here changes on a weekly basis. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if there's more now since I did these slides, but the number of journals is increasing uh, exponentially now. It's very fashionable uh, across lots of different disciplines. And if you want to look up um, examples that might be applicable to your area, there's this nice Zotero folder here and there's a link there which I'll circulate with the slides. Uh, so are they working? Well, they are working. Um, Hypotheses are five times more likely not to be supported with registered reports compared to regular articles. And this has been confirmed in, uh, in two studies effectively. Uh, this is uh, a recent one by Anna Scheel and um, Daniel Larkins. 
you know, there are criticisms to this work because you, you might say that, well, most papers that are submitted for registry reports tend to have sort of ambiguity over whether they are working and the likelihood is that they don't, that, that there is a true effect there and the likelihood is that there, if there's an ambiguity, there won't be a true effect. So this probably doesn't surprise people, but I think it does represent some truth in that if you conduct a rigorous study, you are more than likely to, to find a more accurate estimate of the effect and, and whether it's a significant one or not. Uh, and so I, this doesn't surprise me on that note as well. But that's just in improving the quality of the research. But what about us as researchers? Don't forget, we do still need to get cited and we, we do need to get through the peer review process. And, and to do that, we need to, 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 to submit high quality work. So is a registry report seen that way, not only by the, the reviewers, but also more importantly, the community that, that we want to contribute to? And this uh, nice paper here sort of says everything that we want to hear really. Uh, they look, they ask reviewers to, to rate the quality of uh, registered reports versus non-registered articles, registered report articles on different dimensions and registered reports outperformed traditional articles pretty much on, on most, if not all fronts. And they are also well cited uh, at the very least. They're, they're cited equivalent to, to regular articles and probably cited a bit more. I mean, who's to say what will happen in the future? There, there might be even more citations. It is difficult to say. I mean, they've only really been around for the past, say, five, six years. But so far, pretty good. There's obviously still much to go, but these are kind of just sort of um, tidying up, really. It's just a bit of housework, I guess. Um, Tom Hardwick and John Owen Edis um, published this really nice paper talking about the kind of improvements that need to be made and they make a few suggestions. So they need some sort of central repository to promote standardization, something akin to clinicaltrials.gov. It would be nice to publish the in-principle acceptance to increase the transparency. There are anxieties around this because of scooping, but you could place some sort of embargo on there, although that's kind of discouraged because it would avoid uh, duplication of efforts. That's a typo there, it should say duplication of efforts. It would be nice to see how compliance is checked. As we know from Ben Goldacre's work, and I'm doing a study as well, looking at the discrepancy between pre-registered clinical trials and the final publication. There's always a discrepancy and those discrepancies, there's never a reason given usually uh, for why say outcomes are switched and so on. So a nice sort of check would be good, but given that there's so much attention to registered reports, I think that would be eventually in hand in some sort of workable way. So it's an easy fix. Um, does it constrain researcher degrees of freedom and does it, um, result in publication all the time. Um, can we be certain, for example, that you might not just abandon the registry report when you just realize that it's not worth your while, that you're just going to get a, a null finding. Um, we assume that people will be quite happily to, to carry it on to the end, but maybe they time constraints, they would prefer to do something else that will lead to a significant result. This just will come, answers to these will come out in time. Now, you might say, well, is this really reimagining uh, scientific publishing? We know all this, um, we know registry reports are great, blah, 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 blah. And they're all kind of incorporate in, in the existing sort of infrastructure of scientific publishing anyway. Registry reports uh, need to be endorsed and practiced by the journals, but maybe we could do something different. Um, are they a means to an end or an end in itself? I think there might be a means to an end. Could we do better? I think we could. I think we can, I think we can just take a look back at what exactly journals do. So journals keep a record of science and they distribute it. They have huge muscle when it comes to distribution and they attention grabbing. But what about take peer review away from journals? Can we do that? Do we need to rely on these two? Can we do something with one of them? I don't know. So I'm just going to suggest 
possible ways that we can relieve these jobs of journals uh, or at least supplement them with more transparent and more immediate ways and better ways and equitable ways of publishing research. One of those is preprints. Now, again, I think most people here know what a preprint is, but for the sake of making sure everybody's coming along at the same speed, a preprint is basically the manuscript that you normally submit to a journal, but you also at the same time usually or soon after you submit to a journal, you also submit it to a preprint server. The advantage is, of course, it's immediately available to your uh, the final resting place in the in the inboxes of your well, not the inboxes, but it's circulated to your community of, of colleagues, um, and it doesn't infringe on the actual traditional process. There's lots of advantages. It's faster. They can be uh, made public within a day or two. There's greater opportunity for feedback. Uh, there is a question mark over how many preprints do receive comments. Some estimates say five to 10%, but that doesn't include private messages. There's evidence, a good evidence that uh, it does increase citations and impact, but that makes sense given that it's in circulation for a lot longer than traditional uh, published papers. And, and of course, naturally, it would improve your chances of publication because you're getting that extra layer of, of peer review as well. And the great thing about preprints is that they are increasingly recognised in job and funding applications as a, an actual legitimate publication output, or at least evidence of research outputs. There are anxieties with preprints, issues with scooping, does it prevent publication, low visibility? I think these are all, um, these are all myths that can be easily dispensed with. Pre uh, scooping predates preprints. Preprints, if anything, will actually guard against scooping. There will be a timestamp. Um, so you can actually point to the fact that you set a precedent. And I've even seen examples of where editors, when they have uh, competing submissions, they do look for the preprint to see uh, which one actually set the precedent, uh, if there's a lot of overlapping. I'm not saying that that's widespread, but I have heard it done. And um, uh, you, the Sherpa Romeo is a great place where you can search journals and see what their policies are to preprints. I think generally speaking, uh, journals do accept them, um, but at certain stages. So you would never imagine a journal be happy for you to post the final publication that's all pretty and text formatted and stuff. But a pre-proof or pre corrected proof is is can be fine, but you just need to check that out. And uh, it's now increasingly becoming mandated by different uh, funding agencies in certain circumstances. And uh, preprints result in low visibility. Well, um, this this figure here of four million visits per month to BioArchive alone was pre-COVID. I think it's now actually double, if not triple, that figure. Okay, so we, you might say, well, preprints, yeah, well, that's not much better. That's not really that innovative. But let's just go back to register reports then and try and um, talk about this initiative. Now, this is fresh. I don't know all that is about. The, I, I only recently came across this initiative. But I came across it because I tweeted out in ahead of this talk um, this idea that um, how, how can we put the control, the power back into the researchers' hands? Um, they, is there any way that we can sort of empower them in, in some way to have control over their property, their publications? And one um, suggestion that floats around is, well, why can't journals bid for preprints? Why can't they bid for papers? And then you decide as a researcher, well, actually, I'd like to to submit there. Um, the could cut down on waste, you don't need to keep constantly um, submitting loads of places. So there's lots of pluses to it, but some people have issues over anonymity and, and so forth. However, this initiative does look really promising. So it was devised by Karina Logan, uh, who did Bullied Into Bad Science, Emily Sainer, Zoltan DNS, Chris Chambers, and Ben Pujol. And it's sort of what we know already about registered reports. So first of all, it's a free commercial, uh, non-commercial platform dedicated to reviewing and recommended uh, registered reports, uh, preprints across STEM, medicine, and social sciences and humanities. 
so submission is rec recommended by this community following peer review and the revised manuscript is posted on a preprint server where uh, it'll be hosted and the peer reviews and recommendations are published as well. So this is the recommendation of to publish this um, preprint following stage one. Authors then have the option to publish the preprint in a traditional journal. And you can publish this in a growing number of PCI RR friendly journals. So it basically gives the, the, the author the freedom to choose which of the journals that have sort of bid for um, the preprint. Uh, that gives them the choice of where to, to publish. There's also other things as well. You could say have a stage one manuscript, which leads to multiple stage two outputs, which can be uh, published in, in, in different uh, uh, outlets. So increasing your sort of output, if you like. And then you can do a schedule review, which basically prepares uh, the next phase um, uh, after stage one so that um, when it comes to the, um, the review stage, that uh, is already in line and already set up and planned out. So it's just make the, the whole stage one review time following the manuscript submission um, turn into days rather than weeks, um, which is sort of uh, one of the issues with registered reports, which is that it can take a little bit of time, which gives people sort of um, anxiety because they can't really do anything uh, whilst they wait. More on this uh, can be found uh, at this website here. And uh, if you want a better explanation than I have given, I'm more than happy to click on this and go through it with you. But the idea generally is that by incorporating this uh, intermediary step of, of uh, posting the preprint of the st after stage one, you effectively advertise and get endorsement of your paper from this sort of community of peer reviewers. And then this, of course, will attract journal uh, editors and so forth. And then you can have a pick of the litter. And of course, there's lots of different advantages to this. Um, but the, the key thing is, is that the whole peer review stage is, is undertaken independently of any journal. And the author has the power to decide their destination, uh, the, the, their final resting place for their paper. And there's obviously a growing number of, of PCI RR friendly journals. So that's, I really like that initiative and we can talk more about it if we like, but can we go further? And I think we can. So I want to raise awareness about um, Octopus. Octopus is a, a fabulous initiative um, led by uh, Alex Freeman. Uh, Cambridge um, and basically they they think that we can go further in re relieving um, journals of the sort of gatekeeping role of peer review they can curate and be the the sort of the the final destination for the completed manuscript but the whole peer review needs to be rethought out and it will require us to fundamentally rethink how we, we publish science. Now, what I'm going to do is play this, but I want to check that the audio is okay. And apologies to the producing team because I didn't check this before. So hopefully it will work, but we'll try and try it anyway. So let me see if this will work. So let me change the... Uh, change the audio. Okay, maybe that's not going to work. Hang on. I think we can't hear it yet, unfortunately. Oh, but we get help in the chat. Um, Hannah says, it's an option you have to select when sharing your screen. 
Might that be the issue? We can try it. Okay. I'm guessing. I'm guessing you can't hear that now. No. Okay. I will. I will voice it instead. Um, she. Uh, the reason why I wanted to play it because she's got a very nice sort of clear voice. But basically, this is. This is what they're proposing. She's proposing, and this is endorsed by the UKRN. So we know that we can split up the sort of the research um, timeline into several several component parts. We we begin with the problem, the hypothesis, the method, results, analysis, and, and interpretation. And normally, traditionally, we only really see this in the actual final publication. And um, the issue is, is that we probably need greater scrutiny at each stage of this process. So maybe there's a way that we could actually provide uh, some sort of platform where we can have scrutiny for these different parts of this process. Now, uh, let me just skip forward. And that's sort of what Octopus does. It is an online platform that transparently uh, reports these different parts of um, your study and it allows for um, reviews of each part and the reviews are completely transparent so you can get peer community feedback on each part of this and there's almost like a um, uh, like a travel trip advisor type star rating as well which you can give to each part and then you can do all this and but this the final published manuscript will still go to a journal it doesn't really matter about that but what matters is the scrutiny that's given to each component part of this and you can see this is the layout on the website and you can see here the different component parts the problem the hypotheses the methods and protocol and so forth and you click on each of these modules and you've got this, as I say, a TripAdvisor style rating here. And you can see whether they follow the protocol, uh, whether it was well annotated and so forth, whether it was clear and et cetera. And as I say, you should, I believe, be able to comment on it and give different reviews to it. So for example, you can raise a red flag to say that this doesn't seem right. Um, there's ethical issues here and so forth. And this kind of follows this model that Marcus Manafo often talks about, which is this sort of revolution when it comes to car manufacturing, where instead of just assembling the car and then checking at the, at the end to see whether the bumper falls off, it's much better to actually check each component part to make sure that it works. And then when you get it together, the whole thing should work together. So I am cognizant of time. So I'm going to skip this. Uh, but I do encourage you to look at these videos and the one that Alex gave for the Riots Club. What is nice as well is that Alex really wants feedback on this prototype. So I really would encourage you to go, click on this link and um, also read the blog about it as well. Click on this link, have a play around with it, see what you think of it and give feedback as well for Alex. And I think that would be a really nice thing for you to do if you were to do that, because I think it's a really nice alternative. I haven't given a good selling pitch for it, I must admit, and I'm, I want to take questions, but I think it's a really nice way to relieve the job of peer review from journals. Okay, any questions? Thank you all for, for your time.